Well, welcome. How are you guys doing? Hope you guys got some orange juice out there. Did you get any clam juice or anything like that? It was um, Charleston, what's up? I beat your pastor. So I beat him in golf the other day, too, by the way, by a couple of strokes. So I'm just telling you. So, uh, hey, we are so glad. Let's give it up for Charleston, everybody over in Charleston. So, and uh, we are wrapping up this series called Squeeze. So we thought we would do a squeeze juice kind of a game. And that was somewhat fun and disgusting all at the same time. Um, let me share that we are wrapping up today, which means next week we have a brand new series. And uh, we're going to have a series coming at you that is called, um, I Want a New Marriage. Now, that doesn't mean I want a new spouse, okay? That, that is not the title, I want a new spouse. It's, I want a new marriage, really about relationships, whether you are um, married, getting married, thinking about getting married, um, you invest in someone's life that is married, grandparents, parents, you got kids coming up that, that you need to give godly wisdom to them. Um, Joy and I, you know, we've been married 20 plus years and we, we would still say we want a new marriage. We want a new and improved marriage every day and we need to work at it. And if we go into autopilot, sometimes it just, it, you just kind of actually coast downward instead of upward. So let's, let's take the next couple weeks of looking at relationships and good godly relationships because you'll feel so much better. And God wants you to have healthy relationships. He wants your kids and grandkids to have healthy relationships. So we're going to look at what God says. Come next week, and then I encourage you this, commit to all four weeks. Commit to all four weeks, all four Sundays, and see what God can do in your life and see what God can speak into your life through Scripture on how you can help someone else. Because I know that God's Word, <clears throat> excuse me, God's Word is not just, you know, it's going to help us in our relationships, but I believe He can use us as a conduit to help other relationships as well. So we're going to dive into that next week, and I'm really excited about that. But for now, let's finish up the series on squeeze, because life is full of pressure, and God has a way of helping with the relief valve. He wants to take the stress out of our life, and his word is amazing that, that when we apply God's word into our life, that we can see that we don't have to live such a stressed, wrung out life. We don't always have to feel squeezed, but we can actually know that God's there to give us some, some margin in, in our life. And so we've been talking about being tired and weary. Last week, I went really personal and shared a little bit about what happens when we, the bad news just keeps coming and coming and coming. If you weren't here in the last few weeks, you can always go back online and watch these online. And so we'd encourage you to do that. This week, as we wrap things up, um, really want to um, talk about what it looks like if we're really squeezed and strung out in the area of finances, because that can create such anxiety in our lives. And it's an area of life that we just feel so squeezed in. Um, a few months ago, I was going to a store, and I, I was at the counter. I had my arms full of some, some items that I needed to buy, put it up on the, on the counter to pay for it. And I go, I totally don't have my wallet with me. I had no money, and I'm sitting there face to face, looking at the clerk, all the stuff on the counter, and uh, I literally just had to say sheepishly, I'm sorry, I have no money today. <laughs> and I just turned around with stuff on the counter and I didn't know what to do. So I'm like, I'm out of here. And I just, I literally just walked away and I'm feeling embarrassed. I'm mad at myself that I did that. And, and, uh, and I was out of time. It's like, I didn't have time to go home, get my wallet, come back, do all that shopping again. And then I had to do the, the text of shame. Sorry, honey, I'm not bringing those items home. I don't have my wallet and I'm at the grocery store right now. And um, I think that's just a little bit of like a scenario. Just think of that, that moment that I was feeling of mad, embarrassed, and I'm just out of time to be able to, to really get what I need. I think sometimes we feel like that in a bigger area of life of there's things that come up, an expense comes up, a bill comes up, um, holidays get here, and you're wanting to buy, you know, something for the holidays or do some, you know, a birthday party's coming up and you got to get a gift or whatever, you know, school sends out the, hey, you got to bring this money to, to school. And we have that moment of, I don't know if I have that. It's not that you don't have your wallet with you, but there's this sense of being squeezed and feeling wrung out and feeling, I don't know if we can pay that bill 
this month. Or I don't know if I can, we can be that generous, you know, toward that missions trip or that missionary or just into God's kingdom. And because we just feel wrung out, we feel squeezed. And, and I know that I'm not even going to ask for a raise of hands if you've ever felt squeezed financially because, well, everyone would probably raise their hands and say, yes, that's us. Like we feel the pressures of that. But I know that God doesn't want you to, to feel stressed. He wants you to feel blessed. He wants you to have this blessed life. And so today is not an awkward conversation of, oh my goodness, I showed up at church and you're talking about money at church. I feel like we have a stressed out conversation at home all the time about money. So let's go into God's word and say, how? because God doesn't want us to live stressed out. He doesn't want you to feel this way. He wants you to have some hope and encouragement in this area. And so I want you to know today that we can actually dive into God's word and go, wow, he speaks a lot about this, and it's really good for us. Today, I'm going to take us all the way back to the 9th century BC. We're going to look at a story in the Old Testament that comes out of 1 Kings from a prophet, and his name was Elijah. Now, we don't know a ton about like the background of Elisha. Elijah, we know that, we know that he was a, a Tishbite. We know that he was a man of God. His, his Hebrew name, Elijah, means that it, it's, it's one who, 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 that God is his God. God is Yahweh. And so we know that he had this trust and this faith in the real God and the true God. And he also went bat to bat against some some false prophets of Baal, and so he possibly could have just declared that name, I, I follow the God of Yahweh because he didn't follow Baal. And so that's what we know about him, and then we know that he's just a man of just incredible faith. And we pick up in this story where, where there, was, there was this drought in the land, uh, rain had not came down, so there was very little produce, very little resource. People were in a, in a slump of life. And this is where we pick up. I want to read through the story, and then I want us to understand, man, God has something for us today, even though this goes all the way back to the 9th century BC. God is speaking to me today through this story. Let's take a look at it. It says this in verse 7 of 1 Kings chapter 17. But after a while, the brook dried up, and there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. When I just read that, I felt like that's our life sometimes. The brook is dried up. You might open up your wallet or your checkbook or get online and look at your, uh, your finances and go, I think the brook dried up. And there's seasons that we go through that the brook dries up. There's times that the budget is slim. There's times that the margin isn't there. There's not a lot of extra. And we live in a season of, I think the brook is drying up. And some of us in the room today, the brook, it's, it's, it, it dried up a long time ago. It's just dirt and sand. And so after a while there, the brook dried up. There's no rainfall. It goes on to say this. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed, I have told, I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So I just want us to know that this widow that we're going to find out in the story was, uh, was instructed by God to take care of Elijah and to feed him. Now this story is actually less about Elijah and a much more about this widow. And you're going to see that she's this single mom. She has a son. She's, she's a widow. And we're going to see that the story has so much more to do with her than it does with Elijah. And so God spoke to this widow and said to make sure to feed and to take care of Elijah. goes on to say this. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. Let me just pause for a moment. We're like, why would she be gathering sticks? This summer when we were in Tanzania, we were everywhere we went on the bus and through, or through, the, you know, through, the, through the, the bush, we saw these ladies and kids gathering sticks because that's the only resource they had to cook. They would gather the sticks so they could make a fire. Once the meal was cooked and the fire was done, guess what they had to do? They had to go back out all day and walk through the bush and find sticks. And so you would see these ladies walking along the road with this big bundle of sticks, taking it back to their, to their area just so they could cook that meal. Here we are, 9th century BC, and there's this widow gathering sticks, and she, she, uh, Elijah asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And then goes on to say this, that as she was going to get it, then he called her and said, oh, and also bring me a bite of bread too. 
So now you get the exchange where Elijah sees this widow and asks for the water, asks for some bread. The Lord had already instructed her, whether that was through dream or vision, but she sensed and she knew that God was speaking to her, that she was supposed to help Elijah out, this traveling prophet that showed up in the this, in this city. And so now the request had been made to bring me a little bit of water, bring me a little bit of bread. Goes on to says this, that, but she said, I swear by the, by the Lord your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little, a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook the last meal, and then my son and I will die. Just pause for a moment to the reality of the situation that she was going through. A widow, single mom, drought, the brook is dried up, and she's, she's literally really over-dramatizing this, and she's getting ready to post this on Facebook, that getting ready to eat my last meal, and I think we're going to die, emoji, emoji, sad face, you know, little whatever emoji that's brown, has a little squeaky, whatever, you know, emoji she uses. She's really either really highly dramatic here, or we're, we're really getting a peek into her heart that she was really at kind of wit's end. She was at the bottom of the barrel. She was at the, there's not, there's not much hope left. I would lean that direction, knowing the story and knowing that Elijah comes in and just brings hope into her life, that she really was struggling emotionally, mentally, physically, probably hungry, looking at her child and saying, I don't know where the next meal is coming from. And she's really at a place where there's a lot of pain on the inside as a parent trying to take care of her kid and knowing that resources are pretty low. And so she says, I don't have what you're at. I don't have bread at the house. She didn't have any bread. She was not lying. She had some flour and oil to make some, but she really had no prepared bread. And then she just barely had enough to make to make uh, to make some. So let's continue to look at the story says, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what, you, what you've said, but make a little bread for me first, then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. A couple amazing things here is he says, first, don't be afraid. Like he's calming her spirit. In other words, she must have really fearfully thought, this is it, me and my son, this is over. I am completely out. And now this man just shows up and he's this prophet and he's requesting even something that I don't even have to give. And he's saying, hey, don't, don't be afraid here. And then it's amazing. He says, now, continue to do what, and remember, she was instructed by the Lord. He said, go and do what you were supposed to do. Make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for you and your son. And so he's saying, don't be afraid here. Trust God and do what God's asked you to do. Take care of this need. Take care of your needs. Story goes on and says this. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your container." until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Elijah is saying, listen, it's going to be okay. The Lord is going to take care of you, and you will always have the resources you need in your containers until the drought is over, the rains come down, and the crops grow again. He's like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He goes on to say this. So she did as Elijah said. She did. She obeyed. She, she walked through this and said, okay. Like, you know she kind of begrudgingly and a little fearfully and a little bit, I don't know if this is a good idea. And we don't know the mindset that she was going through, but all we do know is the outcome and the action that she took. And the action that she took was she did, as Elijah said, which meant she made some bread and gave it to Elijah, and then she fed her kids. She said Elijah and her family continued eating for many days. Check that out. And she and Elijah and her family continued eating to eat for many days. Amazing, amazing. Let's go on to look at this. It says, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised 
through Elijah, there was always enough. Always enough. Always enough. And I read this story, and I read it this last week over and over and over, and I was trying to put myself in this story, and I was trying to just understand the, 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 the heaviness of it. And it's really just kind of a mirror of our culture. In fact, when I read this story, even though it was so long ago, I'm thinking, this is us. I'm not talking about a TV show on TV. I'm talking, this is us. Like, this is our society. This is our culture. This is our mindset. This is what we wrestle with all the time. We are the widow in the story. We are the widow that's like, we just borderline, like, I don't know if we have enough. God says, no, I'm going to take care of you. Trust me, trust me, trust me. And, that, and it's us wrestling through this. I was like, that's us. Like, we're the widow. We're the widow. And so I want us to look through this whole story. Just kind of one, I want to teach a couple of things through our lenses. Like, how does this, what if, what if I am the widow? What if we are that person? What are we the single mom in this story who says, wow, I don't, I don't know if I have enough. And so when I look through it through the lenses of my eyes and your eyes and our lives, a couple of things I think about is number one is this, is there will be dry times in life. I want us to just grab this. The word I would use is just reality. Just this is, this is reality. This, is, this, is, this isn't negative. This isn't positive. This is just real thinking. This is, this is coming to the senses of this is just what happens in life is there's times that cash flow isn't where it needs to be, that we need to be honest about our situation. We need to understand that it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian your whole life or today at the end of the service, you're going to give everything over to God, but it doesn't matter. There's going to be dry times in all of our lives. It could just be an economic downturn in, in where we live. It could be your job cuts back hours. It could be your job cuts back positions, and the next thing you know, you don't have a job for a little bit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that can happen to create the dry times. I just want us to know that there, there will be dry times, that it is reality that's in front of us. And so that's not a, that's not a doom and gloom. That's a let's just face life the way it is. Like sometimes there's more and sometimes there's less. And so let's just come to the grips of reality that sometimes there's a drought. In fact, the Lord brought that drought. If you read, pre-read a little bit before the verse we did is the Lord brought that drought for his purposes and so there was no rain. And so there are times that there's just a little bit of a dry season in, in our life when it comes to finances and, and that. And, and so just have this sense of reality. There's going to be some dry times in life. The second thing that I learned through this and I kind of picture, you know, personally is, is this is we will naturally say I don't have enough. That is who we are. We naturally say I don't have enough. It's in us. That's the carnal side of us. That's the, that's the, the human side of us is, is we start looking at our bucket and the bucket gets less and less and the next thing you know we get a little panicky and we get a little nervous and we're like I don't have enough. I don't think I have enough. I don't have enough. And that's, that if, if knowing that dry seasons are a reality, this then is based out of fear. If there was one word to kind of, to, to, to describe this is total fear. We will naturally say, I don't have enough comes out of this seed of fear. We're afraid that we'll run out. We're afraid that it's going to get worse. We're afraid that I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do with my kids, with my family, with my dreams, with my goals. And we're driven by fear. And fear drives us sometimes in life, drives us to make some decisions that we shouldn't make. When fear is the motivator, we have to be really careful. We got to take a step back and go, I'm not supposed to live by fear. I'm supposed to live by faith. And so if fear is the motivator of why you're doing what you're doing, take a step back and say, I don't think the Lord wants me to be driven by fear. And so here is this, this lady that is saying, I, I don't have enough. And she was afraid for her son. She was afraid for her life. She's afraid for their future. And I get that and you get that because we all say, I don't have enough for this very same reason is we're a little bit scared of what tomorrow may bring. We may be a little scared of what the bills of next month might bring, and the next thing you know is like, oh, we don't, we don't have enough. We're not going to make it. We're not going to be able to get that one taken care of this month. And so we live out of fear. 
But then you go in this story, and then the next thing that I, that I really personalize is, is what God is saying to, to her is this, is, is God says, trust me. Elijah comes in and says, man, we just got to trust God here. And I want us to hear today that God is always, always, always moving you from fear to faith. And so this is a faith statement. If, if I don't have enough is, is birthed out of fear, God saying, trust me, is birthed out of faith. And it's us being faithful to what God has for us. And, and it's us saying, I know that the Lord will take care of me. I know that the Lord is in control. I know that, that, that everything in the world is his. He already created all of it. I just need to trust him. Instead, in fact, Proverbs says this, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your best part of everything that you produce. Honor, value God. A few weeks ago we talked about that word, honor is valuing the Lord. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Then, then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. What he's saying is when we trust God and put our faith in him, then, then he'll fill the barns, the vats will be overflowing, the resources will be more abundant. But it's if we honor the Lord, if we trust his plan, if we know that, if we know that God is truly in charge here, and when God says, trust me, then we have a decision to make. Which takes me to the next, next point is that we have a decision to make. We trust and obey. The lady, the, the widow, the, the single mom has this decision she has to make. Will I trust God and will I obey? I told you, we're the widow in the story. Am I going to trust God with every area of my life? Or am I going to pick and choose how I trust God? I'll trust God, you know, with this, but I don't trust God with this. And Elijah is trying to help this widow know, just trust God here. I know it doesn't look like there's a lot of, a lot of flour in the container. I know it doesn't look like there's a lot of oil there. By the way, um, olive oil tastes horrible, horrible, <laughs> horrible. And to call that a juice is criminal to the juices of the world. It's, it's, you use it to make bread and to make your pastor throw up. But, so, so we need to trust. And here's where I want us to get really practical, because what does this look like for us to trust and obey? So you have, if fear is I don't have enough, that's based out of fear. And trusting God is out of a word that we could say is faith. A word that I would use here just to kind of, just to like help us get the big picture here is obedience. What's it look like to live in obedience in, with God when it comes to this area of our f- financial life? Now, the Bible speaks a lot about this, and I'm not going to go into all the scriptures of everything the Bible says, but I can tell you that the scriptures is loaded with that, and it doesn't have to be an awkward conversation at church. It can be life-giving. It can be freeing. It can be walking out of here going, now, if I actually do that, and if that actually works, I will feel so much better, and that's what I want for you guys is to walk out of here going, if that stuff's true, and I do it, and, and it works, then Whew, that's what we need because I'm sick of feeling squeezed and wrung out. And so when it comes to obedience, I think that we need to have a plan and God has wisdom for this. He gives us a plan throughout scripture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down in just a few words. And so here's the plan I'd like to teach real quick out of obedience is the live, give, save, limit plan. I know it doesn't rhyme and it doesn't, you know, but if you're gonna write any words down today, I would write down the live, give, save, and limit plan because I think if you apply these into your life, all birthed out of scripture, all birthed out of God's wisdom, that you will see that you're feeling much less squeezed in this area if we follow this plan. The, 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 the idea is to enjoy life together, but live wisely. That's the live. Live it up. It's okay. Live it up. Always give something. Always save something and limit your debt. Live it up. Let's talk about living it up. Like, actually, the Bible says that's okay. Enjoy it. Like, God has given you your resources and your jobs and your income, and you're, you're not supposed to live this miserable, bound-up life, and you feel like you're in some financial prison. He says, no, enjoy this. In fact, it says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Take a look at this. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions, when he gives you your paycheck and he gives you the, the resources that you have, and the ability to enjoy them, 
to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is a gift from God. This is a gift. God is saying, listen, I want you to, it's okay to enjoy life. It's okay. He's giving you permission. I'm telling you what, there's a lot of churches that, like, you, if you have the money talk, you walk out of here just with your head down and you feel like, like you, just, you just got sentenced to prison forever. And I want you to see the freedom in this, that God says, no, you can enjoy your finances, you can enjoy the possessions, you can enjoy what you have, but make sure that you live wisely, like live it up, but live wisely. Right, like, we love vacation. We love to have fun. We save for that. We don't ever go on a vacation that we can't afford. So we set aside and set aside and set aside and live up, live a life. If, if you've heard all my vacation stories, you know, sharing over the years, you know, I'm a big trip advisor guy, and I want to make sure that whenever we're out and about, I go to a restaurant that you can't eat around here locally, and I try to find the best one in that area, and it's going to cost a little bit more than Taco Bell. It's going to taste a lot better than Taco Bell, and, and it's going to be cool and we're going to go there and experience it and love it and have fun. And why? It's because I feel like, you know, the Lord's given us a time of rest and adventure and exploring and, and we've set aside those dollars to do that. And, and I read that verse and I'm like, it's okay because God says, have the ability to enjoy life. It's okay to live it up. We just want to live wisely. We want to make sure that we're living according to a budget. We're living within our means. If you get X amount of money, then don't spend more than that. Like, let me break it down how it's, how, what this looks like to live wise of just not spending more than you have. Let's just say it's football season and we go to all these football games and my, you know, one of my sons always wants to go to the concession stand. And so you give, so I give my son $10 to go to the concession stand. That doesn't only give you very much at a concession stand, by the way, you know, so you give him $10 to go to the concession stand. And he comes back, and he's got his hot dog, and he's got his drink, and he's got his popcorn, and he's got this. And all of a sudden, he comes back, and he says, oh, by the way, uh, Dad, you owe the concession stand four more dollars. I'm like, I owe the concession stand? He's like, you have no idea the amazing, the amazing display of candy that they had. And I just decided to buy it. Now, this is, he didn't really do this. But, but can you imagine your kid coming back and going, we're in debt to the concession stand $4 because I couldn't say no to all those cool Skittles. So I just bought all those Skittles, even though I bought more Skittles than I had money to pay for. And we would look at that and go, no way. I gave you 10 bucks, spend 10 bucks, buddy. You don't owe $4 to the concession stand. And whoever the joker is that allowed you to walk out of here with an IOU to the concession stand. No. But, but we get that. Like if I give 10, my kid 10 bucks, don't spend more than 10 bucks. That's all you get. And what happens is we want our kids to live that way. We don't want our kids coming back and saying, Hey, I bought more Skittles because they just, they just had all of the Skittles in the world, and it was awesome. But we do that with our own life. Is I know I only get paid this much a month, but man, did you see this? And I just had to buy it. And the next thing you know, we're buying more than we have money to pay for. And it's just, it's just called living wisely. Like, like, let's live within our means. So yeah, enjoy the possessions that you have and the ability to enjoy them, but you still want to live in a wise way that we only buy what we can afford. And then the second part of the plan is live is give, just to always give something. In fact, Proverbs says this, Solomon has so much to say about finances. He says, give freely and become more wealthy, be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. As you give to people, as you give to God's kingdom, as you're a generous person in life, not only are you helping them, but you yourself gets refreshed. It just needs to be a part of our financial plan. It's God is, says, hey, I know you have, so, so give. And he says, give freely, give freely, give freely. Don't be stingy, give freely. The generous, they're going to be refreshed. And God wants you to not feel stressed. He wants you to feel refreshed. I love hanging out with generous people. They inspire me. Generosity begets generosity. And they're just such good-hearted people. And they want to help other people. And I love the fact that when they're done helping other people, they feel great too. I just love being in a culture of generosity because people are just smiling more. And they just feel refreshed. And they know they're right in the DNA of who God is. And there's lots of scriptures that we can go back to on how to give back to God and all of that. But today, just today, if we just follow the plan of just giving something and beginning that process of getting that inside of us, it'll be a game changer for you. 
The other part of the plan then is this. There's live, give, and then there's save. That we need to be savers. We need to set, set something aside. Again, Proverbs gives us some wisdom here. It says this. Um, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools, what do they do? They blow it. That's what it says. They blow it. They, they spend whatever they get. They got it burning in their pocket, and if they got it, they spend it. And, and it says that's foolish living. Foolish living is to spend everything you've got. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm just requoting Solomon here, but he's calling them a fool. Like, that's just foolish living to spend everything that you get. But the wise, they have wealth and luxury, but the foolish, they're spending everything. And so you see this principle of, man, I need to, sp- I need to save. I need, to, I, need to, I need not to spend everything that I have, but I've got to be able to have some kind of structure and strategy to set some back because of the drought and because of the dry season and because of the unemployment and because of the economic turn or because of the flat tire or because your water heater goes out or because the roof leaks or whatever happens to happen You've saved. Now, let me just be super quick here. There's a couple areas that you can begin saving in. As number one is, I would call it, just save for emergencies and emergency savings. I would encourage every family here to have $1,000 in the savings account that you do not touch. Emergency is not, we want to go out to eat tomorrow. Okay, that's not an emergency. It is, it is, in case I get the flat tire, I always have that. Once you build that up, I would not just have an emergency savings, I would have a backup savings. What if you lose your job? What if you need to live for a month or two with no income? Do you have enough savings to take care of you and your family for a couple months? And so you begin to have a backup savings. And then the third part of savings would be a a future savings. We're saving for our future. That's our retirement. That's kids' education. That's dreams, goals, trips, things that you want to do in the future. You begin to save for tomorrow and the next day. And so if we can begin there, have an emergency savings, have a backup savings, have a retirement and a future savings, the next thing you know that the stress goes away because God's plan has helped us feel more blessed than stressed. And then the last part of that plan, you've got the, let's go back to the plan here, is live, give, save, and then the limit. The limit is limit our debt. I would encourage us to get to a place where we can eliminate our debt. I know that's challenging, but we have to try to limit this. In fact, here again, in Proverbs says this about debt. is just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. That when you're borrowing money, just know that you are, you are, you are becoming a slave to the person you borrowed from. If I owe the bank $500 a month, I don't get to choose if I'm going to spend that or not next month. I owe it. I have to pay it. It's there in control now, not me. I signed some agreement to say, I will pay you this every month until it's paid off. So now they're in control. And so if you don't, and you know what debt does? Debt just creates stress. And so if you want to help eliminate stress out of your life, then you eliminate the debt out of your life because it creates some margin. I don't have some institution telling me I have to pay this because I've eliminated that debt. And so I know for some of you guys it would take a while to get there, but if we could start chipping away at that, chipping away at that, and chipping away at that, and have a strategic plan to lower the debt and snowball that forward and make sure that you don't have the debt payment, your stress level will go down. It just will. That's why God includes, that's why God talks about this. This isn't just out of some money matters book. This is God's wisdom of saying, I want to help you in life, and here's some areas to help you. So back to the story of Elijah. So not only did we have to trust and obey God, so that was under obedience and obeying God, but then the end of the story is great as this, is number five of, of what I drew out of the story is the container continues to have enough. When she actually did it, when she actually, when she actually took the, the flour and the oil and made some bread and gave it to Elijah, when she actually obeyed God, when she did, she followed God's plan, what happens is there was always enough in the containers, and God tr- showed himself faithful. I believe that if we trust God, we can trust God's plan, he'll take care of us. Now let me recap the story. There was a drought. We've been there. God instructed this woman to, 
to give toward Elijah. We've been there where God has instructed us to, to, to give back into the kingdom or to, to do something with our resources. She didn't want to. We've all been there. We've all been there. It was like, eh, I don't know if I can do that right now. She does it anyway. Some of us have made that choice of, you know what, I know, I know it's going to be stressful but, or, or feel like a lot of anxiety, but I'm going to obey and trust God's plan. And then what happens is she's blessed. She's blessed with enough. She's obeying God's plan. And God's plan for us, if we can obey God's plan, like he wants the best for you. He really does. I, I've heard this said from a good dear pastor friend of mine, when you take care of God's business, he'll take, he'll take care of your business. And I just believe that. We live by that as a family. If we, if we take care of God's business, he'll take care of my business. And when God's taking care of your life, you know that your stress level goes down? You don't feel squeezed anymore? The, the creator of the world is taking care of you? How awesome is that? Like, like you know, you want to get into my dad can beat up your dad. I mean, you're like, you're like, like, that's a, like, no, you don't know my dad. He created this place. Like, he's taking care of me. So when we put ourselves in the position to follow him and follow his plan, and you know he's taking care of you, it's awesome. It's awesome. Imagine, like, not feeling squeezed in life. Imagine that, that these areas that, 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 that if we would follow the plan of living life and giving and saving and limiting and just, be, just imagine what it would be like. Imagine this, not one person in this room feeling stressed about money. Imagine that. How awesome would that be? How awesome is like you and your spouse and the person next to you is like, there's just, there's no more squeeze in that part of our life. Because, because God wants you to feel his, his favor and his covering and his protection and him taking care of you. He wants you not to be stressed. He wants you to be blessed. And, and I, I know that if we would submit ourselves to him in all areas of life, that we it would be a game changer for us. And that's what we talk about a lot at the Fields Church is if you, if you want a life that just feels full and abundant, then it's giving your whole life to God. Because when we give our entire life to God, then we experience that fullness and that abundance of God. Like he is all in for you. He will, be, he will be all in. But it takes us following him in every area of our life. So before we follow God's plan about money, let me encourage you first is, are you following God's plan for your life? Like finances are important, but your spiritual life takes the cake. That is what is critical. In fact, you, it, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to follow God's plan about finances if you're not following him with your heart and with your life. So for some of us in the room, that's your first step. Like put the money aside, you know, put that in a side pocket and deal with that later. Right, right now, Ask yourself, am I following God? Do I have a relationship with him? Do I know God in a personal way? Because if you give your life to Jesus, he will come alongside of you and walk with you for the next steps. And you don't have to do it on your own. We could be the widow going, I don't have enough. And I don't know what the future holds. And I'm scared of what's out there. And Jesus is knocking at the door saying, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to be scared. He says, you come and invite me into your life. I will walk with you into tomorrow. That's much more than finances. He's saying, I am your hope. I am your rock. I am your firm foundation. I'll be with you. I'll be with you into tomorrow. So I would encourage you guys to ask yourself, do I need to follow Jesus? And when you begin to follow Jesus, which a lot of us in the room today are following Jesus, the next question is, am I following him in every area of my life? Every area. Relationships, time, finances, every area. We've had a great series of realizing if we really follow Jesus, we won't feel that squeeze. And so I want to close today asking you, like, will you really let God lead you so you don't feel squeezed? Will you let God lead your life? 
at all locations here. Why don't you guys stand up and Matt and Charleston stand up. In fact, just close your eyes and let everything disappear for a moment. God's trying to get our attention. I know a topic like today, you're like, oh, gee, I, it's kind of heavy. Let God speak deep into your life today. And ask yourself, am I following Jesus in every aspect of my life? And maybe today you just need to say yes to him for the very first time and give him your life and give him your heart and invite him in. At all locations, we're going to pray. Let's, let's pray together.